in this lecture, let's uh, start at the beginning with the uh, concept of human action. Human action, we say, is purposeful behavior. <clears throat> this just means that it's directed toward the attainment of an end. Or we might say that the uh, desire to attain an end is the motive for action. But we know uh, immediately that uh, simply having an end, having the desire to attain some particular end, is not action itself. In order to act, we must uh, first perceive that there are means that exist in the world uh, that are helpful aids in attaining our end. And we must uh, secondarily be able to control the use of these uh, means uh, as instruments uh, toward the attainment of our end. So we see that human action, uh, or we conceive of human action in an ends-means framework. <clears throat> now we begin the uh, uh, economic theory with the uh, fundamental axiom of economics, that human action exists, or we might say that individual persons act. Uh, Rothbard calls this an axiom because uh, it's self-evidently true. That is to say, any attempt to demonstrate that this proposition is false is an action that has the end of demonstrating the proposition false and applies certain means to the attainment of this end. And so this uh, particular proposition literally cannot be uh, false. Now, additionally, uh, in order to begin the study of uh, economic theory or to begin the development of economic theory, we have to spend some time on what uh, Rothbard calls reflection. Uh, to simply say that human action is applying means to attain ends uh, involves all sorts of other knowledge that we have about action, precisely because we are human beings who act, that we can discover by uh, reflection, just by contemplation of what the basic meaning of action is. And it's from this uh, body of knowledge that we innately have uh, and can discover by reflection that uh, provides us with, with the premises in economics to proceed in a deductive way uh, to uh, spin out uh, economic theory. Now, with respect to valuation, uh, we follow this line of uh, argument, again, from these sort of basic premises through to uh, their implications. First, that only individuals act. That is, uh, human action is uh, undertaken only by the human person. In particular, what uh, recognition of this fact uh, implies is that there can be no such thing as a, a collective agent of acting or for the purpose of valuation. We, we cannot assume that there's something like a collective agent uh, that values things. Right? Uh, whatever valuation we uh, engage in jointly must be uh, reducible to the valuations of each of us individually. Or to put the case somewhat differently, uh, economic theory must uh, explain how to reconcile the different valuations that people have in the social setting. This is especially important in explaining the division of labor, as uh, Dr. Holtzman will speak about later today. <clears throat> uh, in a division of labor, we don't produce for our own consumption. We produce to satisfy the consumption uh, ends of other people and have our consumptive ends met by their production. And therefore, uh, there might be conflicts uh, that exist among the different valuations that people have with respect to production in the division of labor. So economic theory has to explain uh, how this is reconciled, how are these different individual valuations reconciled. We cannot explain this by an assumption of a collective valuation. Now, secondly, uh, action, of course, uh, implies that our uh, ends are currently unmet. Anytime we're engaged in action, we have an unmet end. But an end, unmet end must imply that our means are scarce. If all things were abundant to us, all available uh, instruments of action were abundant to us, then we could act and satisfy our ends all around in every direction. We would have no unmet ends. So the scarcity of means is fundamental to the uh, nature of human action. Uh, or to put the case in the negative, there can be no such thing as a post-scarcity world. As long as we're finite human beings, uh, we act in the face of scarcity. If we act in the face of scarcity, then we must be choosing when we act. If we don't have enough means to satisfy all our ends all around, then when we do act, it must be that we've chosen to satisfy certain ends with our means, and we've set aside the satisfaction of other ends that we could have pursued with those means. 
Now, this act of allocation or choice is obviously two-dimensional then. In order to choose between two options, we're setting them against each other, <clears throat> saying that one is preferred and another is less preferred, or to put the case uh, strictly, uh, the criterion that we use in, as human beings in choosing uh, what ends to pursue with our limited means <clears throat> is our purpose. What purpose do we have in acting? Uh, the purpose that we have in acting is something that we value, the end that we desire to attain. And so it's by a process of valuation that we make our choice. And since choice is two-dimensional, the valuations must be, uh, as I said before, set against each other. They must be made comparable in our minds. We must be able to say, I prefer a chocolate ice cream cone to a, uh, a chocolate eclair. Right? Then I can choose between the two. Uh, I can buy the chocolate ice cream cone. Now, a few more things about preference. Preference, then, is really the main uh, idea of uh, valuation or utility, if you will, uh, that's used in, uh, in uh, Austrian economics. Preference is just a rank order of different options of acting. Right? It's just that we say one thing is better, another thing's not so good. One thing is preferred uh, to another option. So this is all, right? We just have an ordinal rank of uh, uh, options that we choose with respect to. And furthermore, preference exists in action. Preference is part of action. So preference, as we said before, is the criterion by which we choose in action. So our preference is, every time we act, our preference is bound up in our actions. Uh, as we'll see, um, mainstream economists tend to conceive of preferences as separate from action. We have a, we have a utility function, uh, some kind of a preference map, an indifference map or something. And this sort of sits over here to the side and then uh, dictates how we act or how the economic agent would act right? under certain prices and budget constraints and so on. Then you get this set of actions, right? demanding so many units of a good at a certain price. This, this is not the way that uh, preferences exist in real action. In real action, preferences are bound up with the action. Right? We're, we're preferring and choosing in the action itself. <coughs> Uh, for this reason, as Rothbard points out, preferences are demonstrated when we act. So that when we observe people, we see them in their action demonstrating what they prefer. They're choosing to act in the way that they uh, prefer over the alternative, which, of course, we do not see. But we see their action uh, and can infer their preference from uh, what they're doing. I, I, I buy a chocolate ice cream cone. You see me do this you know that I prefer the, the ice cream cone to my uh, alternative action. Now, two other things uh, that are fundamental about value, and these need to be kept separate. Uh, again, mainstream economists tend to conflate these two uh, aspects of value. The first is that value is um, basically or fundamentally subjective. And by subjective, all we mean is that value is an intensive state of mind the basic valuing process occurs in our mind. It's just a judgment of our mind. It's completely intensive to our mind then. It can, in other words, it contains no extensive property outside of our mind. Now, if it contains no extensive property outside of our mind, then we, uh, we, we cannot define a unit of it, right? We cannot uh, subject it to measurement or arithmetic operations. It isn't possible to come up with something like a util of value. <clears throat> precisely because there isn't anything to which the util would refer. Right? Value is not, uh, or, or preference is not uh, like a uh, substance, like a uh, gallon of water or a half-full bathtub of water or something of the sort, where we can apply a unit of measure to it. This is because it doesn't exist outside of our mind, and so there is no unit of measure to which uh, we could make an application. So. There isn't any possibility then of uh, making uh, uh, comparison, arithmetic comparisons of value of different people, right? We could not uh, use this sort of a method to engage in the reconciliation that we mentioned before about the division of labor. Um, uh, th this again is the uh, sense in which uh, value is subjective. <clears throat> now the second uh, basic feature of value is that value is, well, let's say, uh, not constant. There's no constancy of value. And what's meant here is that um, there's no quantitatively constant relationship between external uh, circumstances that affect our action 
of the amount of money I have when I buy the chocolate ice cream cone or my past experience with eating chocolate ice cream cones of this sort and so on, the, the sort of uh, features of the world, the elements of my action. There's no fixed quantitative uh, connection between those features of my action and my valuation of them. So uh, one day I might buy the chocolate ice cream cone. <laughs> the next day, similar external c circumstances, I, I wouldn't. Or to put the case uh, somewhat more rigorously, it's precisely the fact that there isn't any quantitatively uh, definite relationship between the external circumstances of action and the way I value them that leads us to uh, experience the idea of regret. So we take an action and we re uh, regret it, right? You go on that blind date and uh, it's awful, it didn't work out. <laughs> so, well, but to regret something and have this be a meaningful notion to us in action, and it is, right, we all experience this, it must be the case that we could have done otherwise. Why regret if we, in a deterministic uh, manner, had to do this thing that we, in fact, chose to do? No, we, it must be the case that we could have done something else. And so external circumstances don't dictate how we choose and act. Our value of them uh, is the primordial thing, right? It's the essential thing. Now, if this is, the, if this is correct, then it, it, what is implied by this, of course, is that there can be no functional treatment of value. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever then to have utility functions. Functions require constants, but there are no constants in uh, the way that we value things. Uh, nor is it possible, of course, to have something like a demand function where we're not dealing with utility, right? We're just dealing with uh, different prices of a good and the different quantities that a person would purchase. We're not strictly or directly dealing with utility. <clears throat> it isn't the subjectivity of utility that prevents a demand function. It's the lack of constancy in our action. Right? If our actions are not constant, then, well, we, we can't propose that there would be something like a functional relationship between changes in prices and changes in the quantity demand. Now, uh, on the, in the lecture on the Wednesday, we'll deal with the, uh, uh, some of the more in-depth uh, uh, mainstream attempts to uh, get around this, uh, uh, this lack of mathematical functions. And in, in particular, we'll deal with two different attempts that they make. Uh, one uh, is called quantitative representations of uh, ordinal ranks. And the other is uh, the more familiar uh, indifference curves. So we won't go over that now, but we'll cover that uh, on Wednesday. Okay, now if, if our value in uh, human action is, uh, is basically subjective, and if by uh, choosing we're setting one value against another, it must be also then that the cost of action is uh, basically subjective. <clears throat> so when we choose, I choose the chocolate ice cream cone over the chocolate eclair, it must be that the value of my choice, the subjective value of the chocolate ice cream cone is subjective, but so is the cost, what I forego, right, the value of in my mind of the uh, chocolate eclair. So all theories of cost, just like all theories of value, must be traceable back to this fundamental proposition about the nature of uh, cost. <clears throat> now, uh, when we choose, of course, uh, we uh, aim to attain the value of our chosen option and we forego the attainment of the value of the option we don't uh, choose. There must be a value difference between these two. And this value difference we could call profit. It's the net benefit of the action. It's how much we anticipate gaining uh, in terms of the value of what we attain over the value of what we forego in action. Uh, later in the week, I think maybe this is tomorrow, you'll talk in some detail about uh, uh, profitability and uh, its relationship to entrepreneurship and so on. Here we'll just say that uh, the entrepreneurial element in, uh, in uh, profitability of an action is the ex ante uh, estimate or judgment of how an action will work out. So before I buy the chocolate ice cream cone, I, I have to uh, make an estimate, I have to uh, make a forecast about how this will work out. And maybe it, maybe it will work out in my favor and maybe not, but this is uh, uh, done with some uncertainty and it requires my entrepreneurial uh, uh, foresight. Uh, then, of course, we can look at profit in, in our actions. We would also look at profit uh, ex post. We would look back upon our action and say, 
that action did not work out or that action did in fact uh, work out well and to my favor. And uh, uh, these two uh, elements of uh, profit uh, calculations, if you will, or profit assessments are obviously interrelated. And again, we won't go into all the detail about that, but you can see that even the uh, uh, more uh, in-depth uh, discussion of these issues of entrepreneurship and profitability and production and so on in the economy are uh, traceable back to the uh, most fundamental notions of uh, economic theory. <clears throat> uh, then we get uh, now in this line of uh, concepts to the, we might call it the uh, basic mode of, of uh, human action. And uh, this is what uh, Mises and Rothbard call economizing. So all human action is economizing. It's sort of a summary way of expressing what we've uh, discussed up to this point. So we would say it uh, this way, that uh, with a given means, economizing is striving to attain higher valued ends and setting aside the lower valued ones. <clears throat> or we could say, for a given end, economizing is attaining the end with lower cost means, that is lower valued means. So human action is always economizing, right? Striving to attain the higher valued ends with the lower cost means. And this too you can recognize as a basic uh, entrepreneurial um, a principle. So m we can make much of this uh, idea um, in more uh, detail and apply it to the uh, entrepreneur in the market uh, later on. And then the final idea of value that we want to mention is uh, <clears throat> uh, here is the idea of imputed value. I think uh, Professor Salerno had discussed this as well. Uh, but the idea of imputed value is simply that uh, the value of the end that a person is striving to attain is given to the value of means that the person uses as an aid to attain the end. That the value of, uh, of means must come from their aid uh, that they give in uh, helping to attain ends. Not, not the other way around, not, or we might say not in any other way. <clears throat> this is because, as we said before, uh, the goal of human action is the attainment of the end. The means are secondary. The means are instruments to the attainment of the end. So how could they have value in human action outside of the value of the end that they are helping to attain or the set of ends that they uh, perhaps could help attain? Now, just for uh, contrast, we might, to contrast the Austrian view here from other conceptions of this, we might just uh, work with this little schematic. So. It looks something like this. So this would be the Austrian way of conceiving of this, right? Uh, value begins in our mind, subjective value. We have an end and we wish to attain it. and So we're valuing that. And then we perceive that in the world there are consumer goods, uh, goods that are directly serviceable to the attainment of this end, and we value them. And so value is imputed in that direction. And then the consumer goods are produced by uh, a combination of uh, factors of production. The value of these factors of production then would be imputed from the value of the consumer good. So we get this uh, causal explanation. The prices of consumer goods are based upon the subjective value we place upon them as uh, means to an end. The value of the producer goods used to uh, 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 produce uh, these consumer goods are likewise uh, imputed from the value of the consumer goods. Now, if we turn these arrows around and with this direction, uh, that conception, of course, would be something like uh, what some of the classical economists held, maybe the labor theory of value or some uh, cost of production theory of value, right? That value is intrinsic, is an intrinsic property in the factors of production. Like, a, like energy would be an intrinsic value of labor or something. So, so would value under this conception. And then, uh, well, uh, value by production would be transmitted to the consumer good. It takes a certain number of labor hours to make the chocolate ice cream cone, and so that value of uh, labor would be embedded in the consumer good. And then that, uh, that value for the consumer good, that price for the consumer good would be assented to by my mind. I would say in my mind, yes, the ice cream cone is worth four dollars. So this would be a cost of production theory. Now, now remember the basic, the, the basic error here is 
that, uh, as we said before, that all action strives to attain ends. Right? Means are just instruments to attain ends. And so the, the, this, this conception simply cannot be correct. <clears throat> now, the, uh, there's another alternative, which looks like this, where the arrows uh, point in from both directions. This is a neoclassical conception or a Marshallian conception, if you will, where uh, uh, demand for the consumer good is based upon our subjective value, allegedly, and then supply uh, of the uh, consumer good is based upon production costs. So you get the blades of the scissors, right, jointly determining consumer prices. But again, this is just a basic mistake. This is a fundamental mistake. How can, the, how can there be prices for producer goods separate from the value that they uh, have in the, in the producing consumer goods that people value? Where, where could this value possibly come from independently of this uh, value of uh, satisfying an end indirectly through the production of consumer goods? Now, again, there, again uh, this is just a basic, uh, I'm just trying to give you a basic overview of these issues. That later in the week, you know, we, we might uh, go into some of the details and nuances of this. <clears throat> okay, so anyway, this is the way in which uh, the Austrians conceive of uh, imputation. Now, let's turn to this question that we posed at the uh, beginning about uh, reconciling different uh, uh, subjective values. Uh, different individuals in the division of labor. So as we said, uh, the division of labor is where <clears throat> we do not produce for our own consumptive ends. We, we produce for the consumptive ends of other people. So some people are bakers and uh, they're producing bread and uh, other uh, uh, products, uh, selling them then to uh, customers. They're satisfying the consumption ends of those customers and then similarly for other people and so on. And uh, in the division of labor, we'd also like to economize. Right? We'd like to have decisions made that give us higher valued goods and uh, produce these goods in a lower cost manner. This would uh, be uh, the human, right? In every human endeavor, we strive to economize. This would just be the human mode of arranging the uh, division of labor. <clears throat> so let's see why valuation cannot be used to uh, satisfy this economizing uh, decision-making in the uh, division of labor. And let's start with trying to determine the higher valued goods. Uh, as we said before, in order to determine the higher valued goods, if I wish to do this in my own mind, uh, this is a piece of cake for me. There's no problem. There's no theoretical difficulty involved, right? Since I'm weighing in my own mind the options against each other, I just uh, I have the capacity to do this directly. I just say, since it's my mind weighing the two options, I just say, this is more valuable to me and this is less valuable. But in the division of labor, these values exist in different people's minds. And so the question is, can, can by valuation alone, if that's all we have to go on, can we make economizing decisions? Can we rank order these valuations uh, objectively so that we know, in fact, that we've chosen the higher valued option, like we do individually for our actions? And it should seem clear to, to you that the answer is no. In fact, it would seem that there are only two possible ways to go about this. One would be to leave it to a third party. Right? We could have a dictator, a, a wise man, decide for us. But clearly, the wise man or the dictator uh, could never objectively set our valuations against each other. As we said before, in order to do this, because our valuations are subjective, he would have to experience them in, in his own mind. This, this is the one thing we cannot do with other people's valuations because they're subjective. Uh, the only other possibility would, uh, would seem to be that we would uh, s try to solve this problem directly. Just um, we try to get a consensus among ourselves directly, cut out the middleman, cut out the uh, dictator, and just let's do this just by consensus among ourselves. Then we don't have to worry about one guy having to value everything that we value in our minds in his own mind. But again, you can see immediately that the subjectivity of value precludes this. I, I value chocolate, ice cream more highly than vanilla. You value vanilla more highly than chocolate. How could we ever objectively decide whose valuations are, are greater? Who, who, who should have the higher rank order between the two of us? Well, we cannot, right? We cannot do this directly, precisely because our subjective values are locked inside our minds. They're not 
directly observable or it can't be directly experienced by other people. Now, uh, as we'll speak about in uh, some, some detail, because this is the uh, uh, last, the sort of final major point that we want to get to about pricing, it's obvious how the market solves this problem, right? In the market, th this problem is solvable uh, uh, indirectly. All we have to do is have all of our preferences for various goods expressed uh, for and against money. So I, I go into the ice cream store and I pay $4 for a chocolate ice cream cone. Some other person walks in and the vanilla ice cream cone, let's say, is uh, $3.50. And that person refuses to buy the vanilla ice cream cone. Well, you know, he walks out of the store buying nothing. Then we know that my preference for the chocolate ice cream cone relative to money is greater than that guy. This, this is now an objective fact, right? We, we don't need to subjectively penetrate the other guy's mind to know this. He's demonstrated his preference by not buying, by having the opportunity to buy and not buying the good. So with this, with this relative comparison, with the introduction of money in exchange, uh, this problem can be solved, right? We can now say which goods are higher valued, those that are in greater demand, which goods are lesser valued, those in lesser demand. We can add up demands Right? We can perform arithmetic operations on them, where, as we can't do this with utility. Um, and entrepreneurs can, uh, can uh, make assessments then of the revenues and the costs. We'll get to the costs in a minute, but of the revenues and the costs of uh, providing, of engaging in production in the division of labor to provide these goods. Okay, so let's turn to the uh, production side about the factors of production, right? Uh, economizing is not just choosing the higher valued goods, but choosing to produce each good with the lower cost means or the lower cost factors of production. So again, this is a piece of cake for us to do uh, in our own personal actions. Right? We, we know exactly how to do this. Uh, we may have practical problems, but there's no theoretical problem involved. Let's say I want to, when I go home, uh, the grass will need to be mowed at my house. And I have different options for uh, uh, you know, having the grass uh, cut. I could hire the neighbor kid. I could get out my own lawnmower, which is a push lawnmower. I could go down to the uh, Lowe's and buy a riding lawnmower. Uh, I could get out with uh, kitchen shears and cut the grass, you know, one blade at a time. It's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a theoretical problem for me to choose between these options, right? I can figure out subjectively which is the lower cost option to me. <clears throat> but in the division of labor, again, uh, we have a different situation. In the division of labor, as we said before, a single person is not weighing in his mind all of the different opportunity costs of the different options of production. In a division of labor, we're each producing only a limited set of goods, and we're never experiencing the production of these other goods. So we might be an accountant, and so we're never a brain surgeon or a coal miner or what have you, an auto worker and so on. And likewise, those guys are, are not uh, experience. They don't have a personal experience where they could weigh in their own mind and the opportunity cost to them of being a coal miner, of being an uh, auto worker, of being a teacher, or whatever it might be. So again, uh, it, uh, it would seem that we face this basic problem in trying to economize uh, in arranging the factors of production if all we have to go on are valuations. Once again, we have two options. We can get our wise dictator to try to uh, select for us. He could, he could say, you, you will be the doctor, you will be the um, accountant, and so on. He would base his decisions maybe on some objective evidence. You know, this, this guy can cut, uh, cut into another person's brain without killing him. And you know, th this guy seems to be pretty good with numbers. And uh, this guy's very strong, so we'll make him a coal miner or whatever. He could, right? He bases decisions on these sort of objective facts. But he, but he lacks access to cost. All he knows are certain facts of the world, right? That other people could know too, technical facts. We, that's, that's not sufficient to determine cost. To determine cost, we need to know value. And value is locked in the minds of these different people. It's locked in the minds of the person who's, who's made to be the uh, uh, doctor or the accountant or the coal miner. And we have the same problem as we mentioned before if we try to do this, uh, we try to do this uh, among ourselves. We'd never reach consensus, right? Who, after all, would want to be the coal miner? 
So, so when, when we got around to choosing the coal miner and uh, somebody uh, said, uh, let's take Herbener, I, I would vociferously uh, you know, uh, object. I said, no, 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 my opportunity cost is way too high. It's way too high. My, the value of uh, I don't know, doing anything else is, is much too high. And then uh, I'd suggest one of you, right? Uh, uh, and uh, no, that you say the same thing. And there'd be no, there'd be no, we're at an impasse here. There's no objective way that any of us could discern who actually has the lower opportunity cost. We're just, we're stuck. So again, in the market, this problem is solved by exchange, by monetary exchange. So we just, we just freely let everyone with their private property engage in monetary exchange, uh, uh, selling their the factors of production, you know, uh, taking a job here and there. We let other people, uh, the entrepreneurs, freely hire and fire and so on. And there, now we have objective evidence of what opportunity costs are. So we know if this guy takes the coal mining job and he's paid uh, $60,000 a year, that he himself preferred this to his next best option. That's why he took the job. And if he's willing to do it for 60000 and this other guy would only do it for seventy. And they're, you know, we can tell, again, the entrepreneur can tell if they're roughly of equal productivity. He hires the $60,000 guy. He knows, he knows precisely who to hire. He can uh, solve this problem. Uh, and, this, and this would apply across the board to all production decisions. <clears throat> now, again, if we want a little uh, schematic to illustrate this, uh, we might uh, do it uh, like this. Lower. All right. So we start with preferences, and by the way, when we say that we start with preferences, we don't mean that we're uh, excluding the existence of external features of the world, right? We, we dealt with this problem briefly already. We're not saying that the, uh, the mind, that the valuations we engage in with our minds are uh, in the abstract. No, we're, what we're valuing are the external features of the world. We're valuing the means and general conditions of our action. So th these are background, right? It's all understood that these exist. There are other people, there are technical productivities, there are a set of capital goods or whatever, uh, consumer goods, whatever might exist. What, what we're saying is that in order for those, those uh, external objective features of the world to have any effect whatsoever on our actions, the effect comes through our preferences. The, the effect, there is no effect until we value these things. It's the valuation that brings about the effect in our action, right? I choose that as a means. I choose that particular arrangement of production and so on. Okay, so this is what we mean when we start with uh, preferences. And then uh, we just move, uh, the logic of the uh, process moves in the following way. So with preferences, we get the demand for goods. And the supply of goods. And demand and supply of goods give us prices of goods. I'm speaking here of consumer goods, right? <clears throat> so this is the first step. This is the step that we'll cover in this lecture. The last part of the lecture will just uh, fill in the gaps here uh, theoretically about how we go from preferences to demand and supply to prices of consumer goods. The rest of it that's filled in in later lectures uh, looks like this. So the prices of goods then generate revenue for the entrepreneur and costs for the consumers. All right, so these prices lead to economizing uh, by us as consumers. So with higher prices, uh, other things the same, we would uh, use uh, less of this uh, means and uh, substitute something else <clears throat> and revenue for the entrepreneurs. Now the revenue for the entrepreneurs then gives them the wherewithal to um, demand the factors of production and again we're not going to fill in the details here about how, how that works that'll be done later in the week but the basic idea is that the entrepreneur earns the revenues from selling the consumer good those funds then provide him the uh, uh, ability to uh, uh, purchase the factors of production and so his demands what he's willing to pay to buy the factors of production depends upon the revenues he earns from the consumers and then the supply of the factors comes from preferences again the 
the preferences of the people who own these factors of production, right? the workers, the landowners, and capitalists, and so on. Right? They just have preferences for supplying these goods relative to money, and they uh, make deals with the uh, entrepreneurs. And then uh, in the market, we get uh, prices, uh, prices of the factors. And then the prices of the factors generate costs for the entrepreneur. And they generate incomes uh, for the producers or, or factor owners, if you will. <clears throat> okay, so this would be the complete schematic of price theory. That we, and then right, we'd fill in the details step by step. But you'll see for our purposes, all, all we wish to uh, see in conclusion from, from this is the uh, connection, how these two elements over here are connected in economizing decisions, the revenue for the entrepreneurs and the costs uh, that the entrepreneurs uh, uh, bear in production decisions. So it's from those, it's from having monetary expressions of those two things that the entrepreneur is able to make net income calculations as revenue minus cost. All right, so the revenue of uh, selling uh, ice cream of various types to uh, customers and then the cost for produ uh, I mean, uh, hiring and buying the uh, factors of production. And if revenues exceed costs sufficiently, this would be uh, a viable line of production. If uh, customers don't uh, you know, uh, frequent this place and they're not uh, purchasing the uh, uh, goods in a sufficient amount, then uh, the entrepreneur will go out of business. The entrepreneur knows how to adjust every line of uh, consumer good that he produces. He gets rid of the mango ice cream, puts in Rocky Road, whatever, right? He, he can adjust this to consumer demands and, and therefore to uh, economize, uh, to produce higher valued uh, goods for consumers in lower cost ways. And then the other basic, uh, so this is the a basic form of uh, economic calculation, or um, so we'll see what the entrepreneur uses to engage in appraisement, as Mises calls it, decision making in the division of labor based on monetary entries. And the other form of economic calculation, the other basic form, is uh, net worth. Assets minus liabilities, right, on the balance sheet, the accountants would form. And uh, net worth, the, the monetary entries here, what, what is the value of a factory or uh, what are the, uh, again, uh, liabilities incurred by uh, having the factory produced or by acquiring the factory, uh, can be assessed in monetary terms. So the value of the ice cream making machine um, is also based or imputed, as we said before, but based upon consumer demands, what the entrepreneur is willing to pay to get this ice cream machine. And then he knows its value. He could sell it in the market for this value to other ice cream uh, vendors. Uh, and he knows the liabilities that are associated with it, what he had to pay to acquire it, if he borrowed money, and so on and so forth. So in every capital investment decision, the entrepreneur, again, can be guided by economic calculation. You can, you can economize. You can always be sure or always have the reasonable expectation that uh, investing in this line of production, building up capital capacity here, will lead to a greater asset value than the liability incurred. And again, uh, this is not a full explanation of these uh, points, but simply a, an overview for you. Okay, now uh, the last thing we want to do is, uh, as we mentioned, is turn to this, uh, this first part uh, where we look at uh, preferences and how they uh, determine uh, consumer goods prices. <clears throat> And then, uh, as I mentioned before, on Wednesday, we'll look at how the mainstream economists do this and provide a critique of uh, their approach. Now, this is based upon uh, uh, the laws of utility. And the development of the laws of utility uh, proceed in the following uh, fashion. <clears throat> First, we have to recognize that uh, in every action, not only does a person select a means, right, select a a particular instrument like my lawnmower to engage in uh, cutting my lawn. But the person selects an amount of the means, the appropriate amount of the means. So again, for me, it's just a push lawnmower. That would be my capital. 
Uh, but I could have a riding lawnmower. I could probably afford to buy a riding lawnmower, in which I, case I, I'm choosing a different uh, sized uh, uh, means as an aid to uh, uh, my uh, production. <clears throat> so that, that is a selection variable. What, what, is it, what is the appropriate unit or amount of a means to use in action is selected by the person. It's not arbitrary. This is the point. Right? So when you uh, get up in the morning and you uh, take a, uh, you take your morning shower, you use a certain amount of water, but you don't use twice as much or half as much. You select the amount, right? Or uh, you want to, you want coffee in the morning. You drink two cups, or you drink ten, or one, or whatever. You select the amount. That that uh, we call the unit of the good. Okay, so the unit of the good is the amount the person selects is suitable. Uh, for this action. Suitable means, suitable amount as a means to attain this end. It's important to remember that the unit is not an arbitrary thing. It's a, it's a selected uh, amount. <clears throat> and so we asked this question, uh, once we had this, uh, we grasped this idea of the unit of, of the means, we just follow the logic of uh, action uh, with respect to, to units of means. So we say something like, uh, let's suppose we have a guy who um, is, uh, he's, uh, needs transportation. And so he selects as most suitable for his uh, transportation a uh, one-year-old Honda Civic. So he's got a 2007 Honda Civic. And uh, he uses this, he, he selects this because he, it uh, satisfies the, uh, the most important ends to which he puts uh, an automobile. Let's say he commutes to work. And so he drives to work, uses automobile. Maybe on weekends he uses it for other things. Right? So he's satisfying these ends with this unit of his means. And uh, as we've seen before, uh, as long as the Honda Civic is scarce to him, as long as it's a good, he, in order to uh, engage in this action, he's driving it to work and so on, he must be foregoing some alternative use. He's foregoing something else he could conceive of doing with the Honda Civic that he's not doing. Let's say, for example, he could conceive of owning a Honda Civic and uh, lending it out to his friends. He's a very generous guy. So he just, his friends would just come over and borrow the key, and he, he would value that. So this would be uh, uh, his uh, alternative uh, action or, or set of ends that he wishes to attain. <clears throat> Now, we know because of economizing that if we see this guy using his Honda Civic to uh, commute to work, this would be his higher valued end. He selected that precisely because he values it more than this alternative of lending out the Honda Civic to his friends. Okay, and then, as we already discussed, he would impute value to the Honda Civic. He would subjectively value it in accordance with the ends that it satisfies, the manner in which it satisfies these ends. And this would be peculiar to him, right? He, would, he chooses the Honda Civic because it, for some reason he, he's drawn to it. He's, it. It suits him better than other vehicles that he could have selected. This is already built into his action, right? <clears throat> it, may be, it may just be that the expense is lower, right? That might be why he chooses it, but whatever it is, he's selected this. Okay, so, so we see that with the first unit of a means, the person applies it to the higher valued end, right? The highest valued end he can he has in front of him, and then he imputes the value or, or uh, imputes value to the uh, means in accordance with the aid that it gives in attaining that end. Okay, now we just ask this simple question, uh, and again, Professor Salerno, I think, has uh, gone over this somewhat. Uh, what, would, uh, what would this guy do with the second Honda Civic? Well, we know from the logic of acting that since the first unit of the means satisfies his higher valued ends, the second unit would have to satisfy a lower valued end or a lower valued set of ends, again, lending it to his friends or whatever it might be. And therefore, he would impute less value to that second unit. Right? His, the marginal utility of the Honda Civics would, would uh, drop. <clears throat> so you'll notice that this idea of diminishing marginal utility is a, an imaginary construct. Right? It's, a it's an abstraction. It's a, we might say, a conjecture 
about what the person would do if his situation were different from what it is. But his situation, of course, is not different from what it is. He, he currently has one Honda Civic and he's driving it around. But we know that if he had a second one, he would value it less than the first. The marginal utility of his, uh, the unit of his stock would be uh, diminished if the stock were larger. Okay, so this is the uh, first law of utility, right? The idea of diminishing marginal utility. Uh, the second law of utility says that uh, the larger stock of a good is uh, preferred to a smaller stock. As long as extra units of a good uh, are still scarce to the person. Long, in other words, as long as he can conceive of using the added unit of a good for some end, then having more units is better than having fewer, right? Because more ends can be satisfied if he has more units of a good. So this is the second law of utility. A larger stock of a good is preferred to a smaller stock. <clears throat> okay, so uh, on the basis of these laws of utility, then we can uh, develop the laws of demand and supply. And uh, here we just need, again, it's kind of a, we're abstracting away from the development of all the intermediate steps, but we can just uh, rely upon your foreknowledge of this, right? You know about exchange and monetary uh, considerations and so on. So let's suppose that this guy doesn't own a Honda Civic now and he's in the market for one. And so there's sellers uh, willing to uh, uh, sell at some price and he has a certain demand and uh, his demand, as uh, we uh, have seen already, would be uh, based upon these laws of utility. So let's call this guy, uh, let's call him now buyer A. <coughs> and let's say his uh, preference uh, rank uh, look like this. So he currently doesn't own a Honda Civic, but he uh, ranks the uh, Honda Civic this way. And that preference rank says that if he could find a seller who was offering this particular Honda Civic, again, we're not giving the full description of it, but it would have some description, uh, he would pay, he'd be willing to pay $15,000 for it. If the price were 16, he'd keep his money. So that, and this is based, remember, upon uh, would be a derivable or observable from uh, the laws of utility, from his preferences. Now, we know, of course, that, as we said before, that if, if this person does, in fact, buy one Honda Civic at $15,000, the reason at that price that he doesn't buy two instead of one is because of the laws of utility, right? Because the second one must have a lower value to him than the first. Otherwise, he'd buy that one, too. And you'll also notice, of course, that as he buys the, as he pays the $15,000 to buy the Honda Civic, his stock of money is reduced. And so the marginal utility of money for him would also slightly rise, right? Which makes it less likely, again, that he'll buy uh, more units except at lower prices. So this gives us the law of demand, right? Only at lower prices uh, would the quantity demanded uh, be uh, greater. So uh, the basic statement of the law of demand. Now, if we, uh, and, uh, if we want to uh, have a market, of course, we, or at least the standard presentation of a market, again, we could go into the nuances about different forms of it, but we need uh, other buyers. So let's suppose there are other buyers as well in this market so that we can have competitive bidding among them. Let's suppose there's a buyer B. Uh, let's say buyer B's preferences look like this. He also doesn't own a Honda Civic, so he'd be in the market for the first one. And you can see that uh, relative to money, buyers B's, buyer B's preferences are less intense than A. Right? If they were uh, competitively bidding against the only Honda Civic in town from one seller, uh, buyer A would be able to bid it away from B. And let's then uh, make a buyer, let's put in one more, buyer C. And let's make him the least eager of the uh, buyers. Let's suppose that relative to money, he's only willing to pay 11000 uh, to add a Honda Civic to his stock of goods. And this, this again, is just a realistic, uh, stylized, uh, well, I should say, a stylized representation of the, of the realistic condition in the market, right? In markets, buyers are stratified according to their willingness to pay money to buy goods some uh, more willing to uh, buy the goods, some with more intense demand, and some with less intense. 
Okay, then from this, of course, we'd get the uh, we get a demand schedule at various prices that might exist in the market. We could see what the uh, demand would be. So uh, by all three of them, so say at 15,000, we know that only buyer A would buy, but at 13,000, uh, buyer B would jump in. If the price instead were 11, all three of them would buy, right? So we see the, we see the law of demand in the market. So um, as prices go down, not only do uh, each uh, buyers uh, each of the buyers tend to purchase more of the good, or at least not less. Additional buyers are brought into the market. <clears throat> now a similar thing happens uh, again on the supply side. And just on, like on the demand side, let's suppose we have three sellers. And let's start with uh, seller X. And let's suppose that uh, seller X, seller X's preferences look like this. Let's suppose he uh, has, uh, let's see. Suppose through some quirk, maybe his uh, rich uncle died and gave him a Honda Civic. He wound up with two. And so he has a second one. And his preferences look like this. So he'd be willing to sell his extra one, right, the one he, he inherited, at uh, a price of 11000 That's worth more to him than the uh, second Civic. But it would take a price of 16000 for him to sell both. At that price, he would be willing to sell both, right? both his uh, second and his first. So he's a, he's a pretty eager seller for, the, for, the, for the, what I'm calling his second Honda Civic. Now, suppose we have another seller, uh, Y. Suppose he won't sell unless the price, he only has one. And let's suppose he won't sell unless the price is 13 And Z, let's make Z the uh, least eager of the sellers. He won't sell unless the price is 15. And so back up here, if we uh, chart the quantity supplied, we get uh, 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 the following. At the uh, <coughs> low price of uh, 11,000, we only have one sold right by X. But as the price goes up to 13, we get two. X and Y both sell. And the price goes to 15, we get three. So it looks like this, right? And you'll notice that the, uh, the law of supply, that only at higher prices do people sell larger quantity supplies of the things the same, is based upon the same laws of utility as the law of demand. It's just because those additional units that are sold will have a larger marginal utility, greater marginal utility to the uh, seller than the uh, initial units that he sells. <clears throat> now, the price that emerges in the market is the market clearing price. It's the price where the quantity demand and the quantity supplied are the same. <clears throat> now, why is that so? Why? out of all the prices that might emerge in the market, why is it uh, the market clearing price? And this, again, is traceable directly back to the basic principles of economics. Uh, the reason why markets clear is because when markets clear, all the traders have their preferences satisfied. When markets don't clear, some of the pre uh, preferences of the traders are not satisfied. Well, people don't act to have their preferences not satisfied. People act only to have their preferences satisfied. If they're interacting with other people, then the, their preferences have to be mutually satisfied in order for the interaction to occur. So at, when the market clears, when quantity demand and quantity supply are the same, all the traders are mutually satisfied. And that's why this point persists in the market. That's why in markets, uh, the quantity demand and the quantity supplied are the same. That's why price uh, moves to the level where these two uh, are the same. If the price happened to be above this, let's say the price were 15000 in this market instead of thirteen, then we can see that some of the sellers would not have their preferences satisfied. They would, they would want to sell at this high price, but they could not find a buyer. This is precisely why they don't ask a price above the market clearing price. Because if they did, they know, they, or they can, if they're good entrepreneurs, they can anticipate 
that they would have uh, excess supply. And the same for the buyers, right? Uh, the buyers don't offer prices way down here at 11000 because they know or can easily anticipate that if they do this, there, there will be excess demand for them. They'll want to buy the good, but no seller will sell to them. Only if they're willing to pay the market price can they find sellers. <clears throat> so prices are actually at the market clearing point. Uh, and, and let me try to uh, distinguish this <laughs> argument. This, this point of the part of the argument may look similar to what you've seen in mainstream arguments before, but it's actually uh, different and uh, maybe subtly so, but at least uh, it is, there's a difference. What, to say it uh, again, what, what we're explaining here are the actual prices of goods in markets. The actual price of gasoline here in uh, Auburn right now, 379 a gallon or whatever it is, it's that price that's clearing the market. That price is 379 a gallon because that's the price where the quantity demand and quantity supply are the same. The local gas stations think that if they raise the price above this, they'd have excess supply. Or the buyers know that when they go to the gas station, they say, hey, I see on the pump it's 379, I'll give you uh, 369, that the, the gas station owner would say, take a walk, right? Who, who would sell gas at that price when they have plenty of customers paying 379? So this uh, theory of price explains actual persisting prices in markets, whereas the mainstream theory is uh, a theory to explain hypothetical prices, typically equilibrium or long-run equilibrium prices. This is, an, this is a different project that the uh, Austrian theory is not uh, primarily uh, uh, interested in. And then let me just say one last thing about that. Why is it important to explain actual prices? Why shouldn't we uh, follow the mainstream and try to explain only hypothetical long-run equilibrium prices or some other hypothetical set of prices? Uh, the answer is because, as we've seen before, the Austrian notion of price theory is... Price theory is a theory of economic calculation. The thing that we ultimately are able to explain by explaining prices is how entrepreneurs are able to economize the division of labor. Well, they don't do this with hypothetical prices. What, what, do, what do entrepreneurs, after all, have to go on? They just have real existing prices. Right? From them, they, it's true, from these existing prices, they make their forecasts. But uh, economic theory is not attempting to, it wouldn't do us any good in economic theory to uh, try to attempt what their forecasts are, right? We're not mind readers or psychologists or something of the sort. We're just trying to explain what social conditions exist by which the entrepreneurs from that starting point are able to make economizing decisions. Okay, at this point I've run out of time, so I'll, uh, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you.